Hi, I'm Frances Callier. And I'm Angela V. Shelton. And we're Frangela. You know what you need in your life? Hmm. The Final Word Podcast. Yes, you do. That's right. It is the final word on all things political and pop cultural. Where we make real news real funny. Where we inspire you so you can hashtag resist. Subscribe and get a new episode of The Final Word Podcast each week. It's the news we think you need to hear. That's right. We think you need to hear it. Okay? Yeah, it's what we say so. That's right. And because all we do is give, every Thursday you can listen to our hysterical podcast, Idiot of the Week. We round up the stupid because you know what? Somebody has to. Okay. All we do is give. Winstead, host of Feminist Buzzkills Live and founder and chief creative officer of Abortion Access Front, the producers of Operation Save Abortion. I'm so stoked you are jumping in to get more involved in abortion justice. OpSave, as we like to call this series, was originally done as a live stream training day with breakout sessions in between each panel discussion. If you want to see the videos, they're all up at OperationSaveAbortion.com. Now we've adopted that training day into this five-part podcast series, so folks have options to listen and learn in the medium they prefer. But I want to be clear, this isn't a podcast series that you'll listen to while you're cleaning out your closet. This is an interactive series. So you should probably listen up and you need to do some preparation. You might not listen to it today right now, but get together with your friends and make a plan to really do the work. So here's an overview and some tips to get the most out of your experience. First off, gather a crew of folks to listen to each episode who are fired up and ready to learn about abortion activism and who are ready to take action. Because each episode has a post-episode activity guide that you can find at OperationSaveAbortion.com or in our show notes. This activity guide will help you engage in discussions and activities relevant to each of the panel episodes. So listening and then interacting after, it's sort of like a book club, but with activities and direct actions that really help you get a deeper understanding of abortion activism and helps you find your place in the movement. Each episode has a different focus, patient support, clinic support, legislative and policy work, and direct action. And also, we open the entire series with a conversation about reproductive justice. Now, I want to make an important point to you. The goal with Operation Save Abortion is not to overwhelm you with everything that needs to be done. It's designed to give you a meaty orientation of what needs to be done so that you can learn about all the opportunities available and then choose which of these opportunities inspire you and that are compatible with your capacity to give time and to what's available in your area. Now, the first episode in the series, as I said, is about reproductive justice. And it's first intentionally, as we want you to learn about reproductive justice so you can root your activism in this framework and use that lens in every conversation and brainstorming session you have during this series and in all of your activism. The Operation Save Abortion series wants to take you beyond the march. As we like to say, you go to a march, but you build a movement. And this series wants to do the latter. So. Let's set some expectations. As I said, each episode is a broad overview. We're in it for the long game. So if you're looking for deep dives into specific areas where abortion advocacy intersects with other activism, like gender inclusion, disability and abortion rights, and white supremacy and abortion, there will be subsequent conversations and workshops on those and a variety of specific topics. So if it's trainings you're seeking say on self-managed abortion or safety protocols online and in person doing direct actions, you won't be hearing those in this series. But here's what's cool. We have an activist calendar posted in the show notes and at OperationSaveAbortion.com. It's chock full of workshops, seminars, and actions and activities that will give you deeper dives into these specific areas and so many more. Plus, you can always listen to our regular podcast, Feminist Buzzkills Live, because we 
always do deep dives into those issues and will continue to do focused episodes on many specific areas of abortion justice and the intersections of so many issues. So make sure you like and subscribe to Feminist Buzzkills Live wherever you listen. After listening to the series, if you want to go deeper than just choosing events from the activist calendar, we will connect you to specific providers and patient advocacy groups in your area. But in order to do this, we require a vetting process. Why? Because we need to protect our movement from anti-abortion extremists who infiltrate and want to do harm to providers and patients. And it's really important that we make sure we know who you are and that you are here for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. So once we vetted you, we'll connect you to the groups who need your help. If you want to be vetted, you can check out the vetting form at Operation Save Abortion and also in our show notes. Now, And this is really important. Everything right now is absolute chaos. Then you may not hear from organizations that you want to give your time to right away. So in the meantime, really utilize the activist calendar because it's full of amazing opportunities to get active and make change. Remember, we all need to be patient because this is a long-term commitment. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to make your activity sessions great. After you've listened to an episode, take notes during the episode. Super important because you'll be discussing your aha moments during the episode. So you want to write them down to bring them up in the discussions. You'll see that you need a whiteboard for your discussions. Make sure that when you write on that, take photos before you erase it and email them to yourself and your friends so you can further your discussions. And also make sure you check out the toolkits in the show notes. Make sure you download them before you start listening. Have a great time. Really, this is just the beginning of you building community and becoming the activist that you want to see. Wow. This is what I want you to do before we continue. I want everyone to stand up. Just stand up. You guys want to stand up? Feel mm-hmm. free. All right. Stand up. I want you to put your arms in the air, and then I want you to scream as loud <laughs> as possible on three. One, two, three. Take a seat, take a breath. You need that because you've wanted to do that, I don't know, 10, 20 years? The last three weeks? Past three Unclear. Years. You just did it. I'm feeling good about all of you. So, this panel is about how we can use the information we have, our own personal stories, the stuff that is in our gut to influence policy. People can say, we really need to vote, blah, blah, blah. Politicians are not saving us. They are not. We are saving us. You are going to do that. And the way that you can influence policy is by access and truth when talking to people and talking to voters so that they can fundamentally anchor abortion and reproductive justice when they're talking to politicians. They need to know so that they can in turn take your experiences and relay them. We can't just say vote for something if we actually don't bring them those realities that make people say, you're right. People's human rights are on the line and it's my responsibility as a human to make sure that shit is realized. So with that said, I am gonna introduce to you somebody who I adore. The moderator of this panel is my co-host on Feminist Buzzkills Live, our podcast. She's also the marketing guru at Abortion Access Front, and she is going to introduce you to the panel and guide you through all these different ways that you can make change. So please welcome the one and only Moji Alabodale. Take it away, Moj. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So there is so much work to be done helping people understand the role of state and local elected officials um, in supporting abortion access and other reproductive justice issues. So during this session, we're going to dig into this work and talk about how you can take action with incredible people. So joining me for this really timely conversation is Arpita Apanagari, Policy and Partnership Manager at the National Institute for Reproductive Health. Next to her, we have Aria Bolaños Pereira. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Strategic mm-hmm. Communications Director at Colorado Organization for Opportunity and Rep- Reproductive Rights, or COLOR. Mm-hmm. We have Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, and they are the New York State Assemblywoman for District 34. And finally, we're joined by Rocky Gonzalez, founder of Frontera Fund and deputy director of Austin Justice Coalition. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. 
Um, so before we start, before we really dive into this work, can everyone just give me a one sentence um, description of the work that you do? Sure. Um, I'm Arpita. My pronouns are she and her. And I work at the National Institute for Reproductive Health, where we focus on really building and passing proactive, progressive policy at the state and local level. So we work really closely with advocates on the ground in a variety of states, cities, and counties, trying our best to really fight back on the offensive. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Arya, she, her, Aya pronouns, and I am the comms director at Color. And Color Latina for the past 24 years has been ensuring that the Latina community is represented at both uh, with policy, legislative work, but also in our community. So we are the lat only Latina led Latina serving reproductive justice organization in the state of Colorado. And we are proud of the work that we have been doing and will continue to do to advocate for our community's needs. Uh, hi, my name is Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I am an assembly member representing the 34th district in Queens, New York. I use she, her, a, yeah, pronouns. Uh, what I do, I advance policy and legislation that impacts the lives of every single New Yorker. Um, but I think more importantly, I was the former executive director of the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, uh, where we partner with organizations like Color and National Institute and others to fight for health, dignity, and justice for Latinas, their families, and the communities across the whole country. So, so excited to be here. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Rocky Ayushi and her pronouns. I'm the deputy director at Austin Justice Coalition, and I'm founder of Frontera Fund. Um, and at Austin Justice Coalition, we focus on um, criminal justice advocacy, um, but we really have more of a growing intersectional approach to the organizing, movement building, and advocacy work that we do. Um, and Frontera Fund is an abortion fund that serves the um, Rio Grande Valley, which is the mm -hmm. South Texas border area, which is my homeland where I'm from. And I'm representing both of those orgs today because we're at a moment in time where it's important to highlight the intersection of criminal and reproductive justice. Um, and there's a lot more to say about that, but for now... <laughs> Thank back you. Uh, so anybody who's been paying any attention to this know that the state of abortion access across this country right now is wildly different, like a puzzle missing a lot of really important pieces. Um, and this is due to a whole lot of incredibly trash state laws. <laughs> uh, so Arpita, can you tell us more about NIRH's focus on state and local level policy and sort of the wins you've achieved in this area. And really, it's like focusing it on like how the proactive steps you took in Mexico, in New Mexico, kind of helped lessen the Dobbs bloodbath. Yeah, absolutely. So the National Institute for Reproductive Health is really focused on working at the state and local level because the federal government isn't going to save us. Mm -hmm. And if y'all didn't know that before, you certainly know it now because the past three weeks have been tepid, I guess is the word mm -hmm. that journalists are using. I have many other words <laughs> that I would use <laughs> myself. Yeah. Um, and state advocates and local advocates, like the folks who are sitting here today, they're on the ground. They are serving people directly and they are so connected to what is going on, not only in their communities, not only through their organizations, but also under the dome and in the Capitol. And so, as Moji mentioned, one of the things that we have done in New Mexico is that we worked really hard to decimate mm -hmm. their pre-row ban. And now New Mexico is kind of considered a safe haven state for not just folks living in New Mexico, but also the surrounding states. We have clinics who are moving from, you know, other states to New Mexico so that they can continue to serve people and so that they're adding to the capacity of a state that really needs that capacity. And I want to be clear that when I say we're on the offensive, it would be really easy to think like, oh, you only do work in Colorado or New York State or California. But red states are a critical piece of the puzzle. They are a critical piece of our strategy. I myself am from Indiana, mm -hmm. and I really recognize the ways in which red states can be written off and written out of these conversations. And so a lot of what we do is we're connecting to folks in red states and we are 
being creative and you can be really nimble at the local level. You can do things with city governments and city council members that you can't quite do at the state level. And so we're talking to folks in really, really red states who are ready to decriminalize abortion, mm -hmm. who are ready to say out loud and proudly that they're safe haven states. So, you know, we're really excited about that value that we hold in our work, that being on the offensive doesn't mean that we leave anyone behind. It means that we're bringing everyone into a really progressive movement. And it, yeah. I mean, it is incredibly important. The Dobbs decision was essentially Mississippi's legislature mm -hmm. making a decision that worked its way up right. to the federal level. Yeah. Um, Jessica, before you became a state assembly member, you were the, you've mentioned, the yeah. executive director of the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice. Um, with your work as both an activist and as an elected official, what are the tools that people may already have or can build in order to change minds and influence policy, which I think really kind of builds into what you were saying about red states? Yeah, I definitely consider myself an activist in office. <laughs> and I think it's so important to get more activists in office because my work at the Latina Institute over the last 13 years, I got to work in the Rio Grande Valley and I saw the ways in which immigration and criminal justice and economic justice and all sorts of policies impact someone's ability to get abortion access before Roe fell. Yeah. So we know how many barriers exist and that's sort of the lens I bring. Um, but what I do and what I ensure that our community understands is that their most important tool is their voice. And elected officials like me are, we are, they are our bosses. So the fact that the community, whether you can vote, whether you speak English, whether, you know, you're engaged civically, like we're accountable to our community. Mm -hmm. And that's something really, really critical that everyone needs to understand because going to elected officials, you don't have to worry if you are someone who votes or speaks English even um, or is engaged. But that point of engagement, your stories are actually the most powerful tools you can bring to the table. And don't be afraid to reach out to your elected official. Know who your city council members are. Know who your county commissioners are. Know who your state representatives are. Because you might see them in the grocery store. <laughs> and you could stop them in the grocery store. I've been stopped in that way. But know that your most important tool is your voice and the stories that you bring. And don't forget to ever make the ask. When you meet your elected officials, tell them what you want, tell them what you need, and tell Tell them what you expect of them to represent you. It is so important to remember to make the ask. Yeah. I feel like we meet people and we forget to, to make demands. Yeah. Yeah. We need to yeah, make demands. To. And in order to enact change, it really does still take more than one person, right? I feel like you make your one demand and then other people make demands in the an ideally uh, critical mass. Mm -hmm. Politicians are like, I'm hearing this a lot. Yeah. But it also takes coalitions and organizations working together to make this happen. And so, Rocky, can you talk with us about your work around coalition building in Texas and what other states can learn from that? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, there are a variety of coalitions in Texas currently working at different speeds and with different capacities to address the on-fire garbage can of the legislative <laughs> situation that is Texas currently. Um, and um, one thing I like to just acknowledge and say is that, like, our, our folks are, are empowered and sharp yeah. and prepared, right? Like we've been preparing for this for a long time, but also we're tired, they're tired, mm -hmm. you know? And so with folks who are, are, are new, who are, who are watching or who are newly fired up about, you know, joining a coalition or volunteering or whatever it is, just know that like there's a lot coming, you know, and we've, we've just needed a moment to cry mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and hold each other and um, deal with all that's, you know, come up. Um, mentally and emotionally around around the decision and, and just how it's impacted Texas. And so, you know, Texas is the largest state. We're a huge, huge region. Um, and so coalition work is really important, right? Like we have um, so much ground literally to cover, right? And so there is uh, several local coalitions. We have the local repro power coalitions that are working in the big like metro areas to um, pass municipal legislation in, in Austin where I, where I live and where I work. We are, you know, working on policy at the city level that decriminalizes mm -hmm. abortion. Our DA and several other DAs around the state have come forward and said that they are not going to prosecute. And what we're looking at now is the, the sort of 
pause, necessary pause of operations of the network of abortion funds around the state. Um, like we were talking about earlier, the coalition of abortion funds that serve the different regions of Texas are now categorized as criminal, right? Like what we do is now considered aiding and abetting abortion. It's a criminal offense. And so we've had to pause operations so that we can like figure out what comes next. And so we have always worked in coalition. We have always, you know, worked with one another to get folks the support they need to make sure that folks get the access to the abortion care that they need. And we're having to sort of reframe and re-envision and reimagine what our coalition work looks like going forward. Um, and we have some exciting stuff coming up very shortly. So stay tuned. We were speaking earlier and you said that, um, cause we don't hear much about mm -hmm. this, but there's a current legislative lex le uh, landscape in Texas that you are working with other people to fight things about. Is there anything more you wanna say about that? So much more, I'll, tr I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I think what I want folks to know, especially if you are from Texas or if you live in Texas, um, people and like media, everyone wants to know what, what is happening, what is the law, what exactly is or isn't okay. Um, and what I tell people is we have literal teams of lawyers, right? Like litigators, civil attorneys, criminal defense people, like teams of lawyers that cannot answer that question succinctly. <laughs> the, the gray area is, is enormous and things, it's emergent, right? Like things are still forming so in Texas, the weave that we're dealing with is um, as soon as um, decision day happened, within, I want to say, like a week, um, we saw our AG um, go ahead and green light prosecution under pre-Row statute. So mm -hmm. laws that were on Texas books before Row that became unconstitutional now are wow. being brought back to the mm -hmm. team um, and green lighted for prosecution. We're also looking at the trigger ban that goes into effect and people, there's still some, um, you know, lack of clarity as to how that sort of interacts with the pre-Row statues mm -hmm. and like what's going to, what's going to come of that. And over the course of the last two and a half to three years in Texas, we've also dealt with a series of like temporary bans, right? So early COVID, yep. mm -hmm. our state was like, abortion is an essential health care mm -hmm. and they banned it. So they really yeah. take, have taken every opportunity to shut us down. So we had a essential health care shut down and then we had SB8, mm -hmm. you know, shut down and it just has kept happening. And so there's all of these different layers and, and levels that we're dealing with. But one strategy that I think is servicing, that I think is going to be really powerful is these municipal campaigns, right? Mm -hmm. So Austin, is the first city in Texas to pass a municipal campaign. And myself and other abortion advocates from um, Central Texas um, came together to support the development of the policy. And we're looking at, you know, where can we strategically bring folks to the table to, you know, do what they do with these trigger bans, right? Like, let's make some copycat laws, some good ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and put them out there. So again, want folks to stay tuned for that and get involved. Well, and it's it like that muddiness is what they want. It's mm -hmm. what anti-abortion legislators want to put in front of state and local advocates. Mm -hmm. They want it to be paperwork and piles of red tape. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons that we are always so adamant that state and local people on the ground are the experts. Mm -hmm. They are who you should look right. to for the right information. They are who you should look to for the state of play, even if their answer is I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the out. reality. Yeah, and I that's what they want. That's what they've been planning for, you know. And it really right now feels like the wild, wild west. Yeah. <laughs> which is a wild analogy yeah, for yeah. Texas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, Aria, there have been some success stories. Colorado is one. Um, you guys helped beat a ballot initiative in an election year. Yes. That the voters, ha had it passed, yeah. um, it would have banned abortion at 22 weeks. Mm -hmm. And people may not know this, but Colorado is one of the few states that allows for later abortion care. Yeah. So that so many people would have been affected who need this essential kind of care. Um, so ballot initiatives are really important to talk about. And it's a little bit of this, this sort of, more um, smaller legislator slate of wins that we can have. So can you share how you like framed this, both the ballot initiative and also the importance of later abortion care uh, to get people fired up in Colorado? 
Sure. So uh, later abortion care, and this is one of our talking points, it's actually a political term. It isn't a medical <laughs> mm -hmm. fact. It isn't a medical statement. So mm -hmm. when you're thinking about like later abortion, what are you thinking about when we mm -hmm. say that? It's because it's a political term. Right. And we ensured, I mean, one of our strategies, Color and our Latina community, uh, most of our community lives in rural areas. Mm -hmm. They live in clinic deserts mm -hmm. where they do not have access to not only the resources to either terminate a pregnancy, uh, but also they don't have access to the resources to raise a family in a safe and healthy environment, which is a crux of reproductive justice, right? And so with valid initiatives, I mean, they are, you could say smaller, but they take millions of dollars, thousands okay. of signatures, yeah. countless of hours, organizing, knocking on doors, educating the community in more than just one language. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. not everybody that votes Speaking speaks English. one language yeah, or right. English, right? Yeah. So th those were the strategies that really allowed um, Color and our members of the Colorado Reproductive Health Rights and Justice Coalition to beat Proposition 115. And also, mm -hmm. we like to say, more Coloradans voted to repeal Prop 115 than they voted for Joe Biden. Oh, <laughs> More Coloradans uh, believe on that. I'm, like not calling out the president, but let's say. It. Uh, but you know, and and it's also for folks who recognizing that legislative action looks more than just like our elected representatives. They look like organizing so for ensuring that a ballot initiative that actually is going to create good, because there's a lot of ballot initiatives that create very bad things mm -hmm. yeah. so and sometimes I, I feel like when we look at them some of the, yeah. sometimes they're framed to be confusing yeah Correct. so it's like oh no it's yes, yes, yes and if no. you think you yes. should yes. not yes. have yes. this thing that maybe yes. you wanted to have and it's like, <laughs> like wait a i'm sorry what <laughs> yeah. well, speaking yeah. of great ballot initiatives michigan's ballot initiative just set a record in the michigan signatures. for yeah. the number of signatures ever on a ballot measure ever in Michigan, mm -hmm. and it's a great ballot initiative to secure abortion access rights. And it, it's like mm -hmm. you're saying, more Coloradans voted to defeat Prop 115 than for Biden. <laughs> yeah. Michigan showed up. Michigan was not a swing state on that ballot initiative. Mm -hmm. yeah. People signed. People were out there. I think the final number was like 200 organizations had organizers mm -hmm. on the ground working mm -hmm. for this. It's mm -hmm. incredible. It's really incredible. And actually, it's interesting because in New York, we have a little bit of a different process. It's not about signatures. It's often about getting legislation passed in two terms, mm -hmm. and then it gets goes to the ballot. And we just, after many months of fighting, finally got the first step of the Equality Amendment yes. included. Um, so an Equal Rights Amendment mm -hmm. um, protecting pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes. And it also serves to protect um, LGBTQ communities, particularly the trans communities as well. So first step, we got it passed uh, mm -hmm. this session. It has to then get passed yeah. next session and then it goes to the to the ballot. Um, but that education is so important yeah. because we're going to need every yep. single voter to understand what it is and why it's critical to vote for it. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is what ground up organizing looks like on the policy level, yeah. right? Yeah. Like starting locally yep. um, builds a movement, yeah. right, on, yeah. on the policy legislative yeah. angle. Yeah. And I think to like all, in, at least in Texas, um, you know, every city has its own right to self-governance, yeah. mm -hmm. but every city has a different set of mm -hmm. rules around yeah. what a ballot initiative or an ordinance um, process looks like. And so it's a ton of research. And like yeah. you were saying, like, we need money for that. Yeah. Like we really yes. need resources yep. um, to make these things and happen. And that's some of the things we need. Um, I'm hoping we could sort of round out our panel by just everyone really good, maybe doing a little bit of a deep dive into like how people can activate voters and politicians mm -hmm. using abortion as the issue. Mm -hmm. Maybe start with your. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we'll just go down the line. <laughs> sure. I. So there are any number of ways to get in touch with your politician, but I think it's exactly what you were saying um, about that education piece is yeah. so critical. And so one, plugging into your local networks of advocates, mm -hmm. like I can't say enough that local folks are the experts. And yeah. I think I repeat myself because I'm blessed enough to work with them every day. I'm blessed enough to be on the phone with them and learning from them. So, you know, if you're here today, just do a quick Google of the abortion rights landscape mm -hmm. in your in your state, in your yeah. city even. You may have an expert right next door who mm -hmm. you can go and talk to and who would be willing to talk to you about that. And I think second, like there is no such thing as too local, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you have a city council and you're, you know, I'm from a pretty small town in Indiana, but we've got our city council, we've got a mayor. Those are sites for advocacy. That's if right. you write a letter to your city council member, go and deliver it in person. Mm -hmm. If you have the opportunity and the time to, you know, figure out a way to go to a city council meeting and just claim your time. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that you said that y'all work for us, yeah. right? <laughs> like that is such a key mm -hmm. part of this is that your elected official works for you. If they don't do their job. Get both them out. You <laughs> get both them out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Aria? I mean, going back, to, I love saying that like the Capitol is like the people's house. Yes. Mm. Right, and the folks in there are guests. Ah, so I, I, I can go. Know. I can go in there and be like, That's "Listen, big. you said you were going to vote on that, and you uh -huh. didn't." Uh -huh. um, but you know, I also I have some background working with candidates, and it's ensuring that we're calling them in mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. talk about these issues, mm -hmm. reproductive justice, especially like something that made uh, passing, actually codifying abortion in Colorado with the Reproductive mm -hmm. Health Equity Act mm -hmm. so like crucial was that we made sure that our sponsors knew reproductive justice like mm -hmm. the back of their hand, mm -hmm. that they understood why it was critical for us to codify this right. Yeah. And for them to feel comfortable in talking about this issue, even if it was uncomfortable for them to learn about it, yeah, that's right. right? Because they knew that we needed to be on the right side of history because a lot of folks are calling Colorado home now. Mm -hmm. They are moving, they're coming to us for care yeah. and we are gonna ensure we keep those doors open. Mm -hmm. But in order for, um, you know, legislative uh, folks and people that are like really work within people, the people's house. Mm -hmm. We're calling you in, like be comfortable in discomfort yeah. and learn from us yeah. because you're not going to be able to do the work that you want to do without us. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because we're going right. to, we're going to bust open that door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so, sorry. Yeah. Or you know what? Something that was critical for us, more activists and organizers started running for office. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they kicked out the folks that had been there for 25 years. Yeah. And now we have people that really represent us and our values. Mm -hmm. yep. And that, that's really how the movement is also going to move forward. Yeah, and Jessica, and then, can you give more tools of yeah. like speaking specifically to politicians yeah, about yeah, abortion I, um, and I getting the say, same abortion? I was one of those um, <laughs> those activists that worked with community to like train them how to engage with politicians mm -hmm. and elected officials. And I saw the way many elected officials treated their constituents, their bosses, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is not okay. And that's why we need more of us in there. Um, but what are some of the tools? Storytelling, yeah. right? What is your personal story? And again, don't be afraid to share that. Um, what is the ask? Do you want the person to sponsor a bill? Do you want them, are they on a committee that needs to, the bill needs to move through that committee? Um, do they, you know, is it facing resistance in, you know, in a different committee? Like what are the, you have to sort of power map a bill, right? Look at, you know, you know, who's, you know, the champions, who do we need to move? How do we need to move? And as an elected official, like, you can't take the organizer out of the girl, right? I'm like, <laughs> I'm working with the organizations. I'm like, okay, talk to this member because they live in the Bronx and they, you know, work with the speaker and, you know, and we have to like think about, and this donor is, you know, you know, supports this, this person who needs to get on our bill. And um, so it's really important to think about all the layers, right? Think about it very holistically. As activists, like we really think about intersectionality mm -hmm. and thinking about all the layers to um, an elected's life, right? And how they get elected, who's their base, who's their, um, who's important in their community, who can be those um, stakeholders and spokespeople that are most close to the elected. So it really takes sort of a, a ecosystem to move um, policy. But in terms of you going to your own elected is about, again, knowing who all those people are at every level, um, telling your story, making the ask, and following up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Follow up because a lot of them say, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. They don't get on the bill. Yep. They don't vote for the bill, right? Hold them accountable. Show up at their office. Bring petition signatures. Bring your neighbors, right? This is so, so important. And again, work across the ecosystem of either the city or the state or whatever entity you're looking at to, to really strategize all the points of contact to move legislation. And, you know, I'm someone that loves to do it from both ends, end, um, but it's really empowering to see the diversity of voices mm -hmm. and perspective and experience at the table. And me as, as an elected official, I know not to just go to the, the Planned Parenthood who are really powerful, uh, but it's the like the Latina Institute and the Asian American organization, the black girls groups and the LGBT organization. Who are the other partners that can mm -hmm. be at the forefront of this work whose lives are most impacted? Mm -hmm. 
And Rocky, you interact with legislators, but often in a really hostile state. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> what are yes. tactics you can use for this organizing or for talking to legislators <laughs> who like are not on your side, but are your you're their boss? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it is important for folks to hold, you know, elected officials accountable. Um, I will say that, you know, as someone who's been doing abortion advocacy for, you know, 15 years or so now, um, it's a little bit of a shock to the system to see so many Dems now being like, oh, we need to save abortion. <laughs> it's heartening. Yeah. But we're like, you know, cool, thanks for getting on the bus. <laughs> um, yeah, preach, I guess. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes I, I have a lot of, uh, like, personal trauma, at, you know, from going into the Capitol, like, you know, it at session um, in Texas. And sometimes it's actually just, I'm um, just to be totally real, it is not safe mm. to try and interact with those people. Like, you do not want to talk to people like Ted Cruz. Like, no. Keep yourself, like, how do you work like, around that? You know, we um, have to um, push the folks that are on our side, mm -hmm. right? So we have this new wave of younger Dems who are willing to say abortion out loud. Mm -hmm. Granted, there's a campaign trail that folks are on right now, but it's an opportunity, an unprecedented one that we haven't seen. And so for folks really looking to affect change at the policy level, like follow, like, you know, we're saying follow up with them, mm -hmm. follow their campaigns and make sure that they're coming through on their promises specifically about abortion. Uh, organize like trackers and make sure that when they don't come through on their word, flood their offices, mm -hmm. you know, get build a base that can put the pressure needed on the elected officials that are that are on our side, at least in Texas, mm -hmm. um, and replace the old white men, yeah. that, yeah. and, you yeah. know, yeah. holding yeah. things down, you know, for 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 so long. And so, you know, for elected officials, um, you know, who are coming into power and who are now willing to say abortion out loud, like there needs to be, I feel like just personally, there should be some acknowledgement of, you know, the responsibility of the Democratic Party for where we are right yes. now. Yes. 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 Um, it's not, it's not a binary issue. We've been pressing Dems for a really long time and they have not come through. Yeah. Yep. Nope. Um, and I'm personally really excited about this new crop of black and brown and queer mm -hmm. representation that is coming up in Texas um, in terms of um, our elected officials. So it's a new opportunity. It's an unprecedented one. And folks mm -hmm. need to follow um, and make sure that we, yeah. you know, hold them accountable, you know, and give them the resources that they need to understand the work. And again, mm -hmm. always, always tracking back yeah. to folks who've been doing this work um, for a long time. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I think a lot of people who did not work in abortion didn't think about when they thought of like the fall of Roe was that uh, all pregnancy outcomes that are not a live, healthy baby could become something criminalized. Mm -hmm. um, and that we already have this problem, but yeah. just without the protections of Roe's, we're going to, Roe, we're going to see it yeah. Um, yeah. getting anywhere. So could whomever wants to just kind of speak of like, what can we do to fight this wave of even more criminalized um, uh, pregnancy outcomes that we anticipate especially in redder states, but sometimes even in blues. It happened in Cal Definitely, California, yeah. too. Yeah. I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough subject, not only because it's going, to, it's going to get so much more dire now, but because it was already so dire. Mm -hmm. We yeah. saw family separation. We saw people locked up for pregnancy outcomes. You know, when Roe was the law of the land, yeah, when yeah. seemingly everything was quote unquote okay, those of us in the movement knew it was very, very far from okay. Never enough. Yeah. Never, Never enough. enough. Yeah. And in my own home state, poor V. Patel went to prison That's right. mm -hmm. um, for a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see not only an uptick in that kind of criminalization that we've already seen, but I think we're also going to see some some real questions around family separation, some real questions around, especially in immigrant communities, mm -hmm. especially in black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see, you know, for people who use drugs, mm -hmm. hospitals are already an unsafe space for them. Right. And going there when you are a person who used drugs and you are parenting or you are pregnant it's signing up to interact with law enforcement. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as 
a personally myself, an abolitionist in this work. Mm -hmm. I don't think training law enforcement is mm -hmm. the answer. I think it is really talking to, as you said, Rocky, the Democrats who are new and the Democrats who are kind of on our side, mm -hmm. but are, you know, when we ask them to be on the offensive, they're like, who me? Is really educating them about how devastating across generations something like this can be because you hear it and you're like, that sounds bad. Mm -hmm. But you see the true effects of family separation. You see the true effects of people going to prison because they had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. That they couldn't explain in a way that you felt mm -hmm. was comfortable. And I think above all, I come from a family of medical professionals. Medical professionals do not comply in advance. Mm. Do not Talk to law enforcement mm -hmm. about your patient's yeah. care. That's right. They are your patient. Yep. They are yep. not just someone coming in, mm. maybe having committed a crime. You are not mandatory reporters. Mm -hmm. You are not required to comply in advance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because we haven't, you know, there isn't a law in the books saying this needs to be criminalized. And potentially a HIPAA violation. And, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have even, you know, Secretary Becerra talking about what is and isn't a HIPAA violation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The main point is that physicians working with law enforcement or criminal, the criminal legal system interacting with the healthcare system, that's a travesty yeah, yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say in, in blue states, right, we have to do what we can to protect our patients, people coming to our states to receive care, and the providers providing that care. Yeah. So I'm proud that we just passed a whole slew of legislation that does exactly mm -hmm. that. Other states have uh, follow suit. Connecticut recently passed yeah. a number of bills that prohibit extradition back to, you know, for patients back to their home state if it's illegal in their home state. So that's important too. Like those states that claim to be safe access states need to show up. Um, and I'm proud to have introduced a bill that is called the Reproductive Freedom and Equity Fund because not only do you need the legal protections, we need the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need the money. We need the money to get to the clinics, right, to provide additional staffing, support, security, right, the capacity needs. We need to ensure that they're paying for the care that they mm -hmm. get, right? Many of the people that I've worked with over the years in places like Texas are uninsured and need those resources. And we need the practical support, the child care, the travel, the hotel, the food, anything that people need to get to uh, to ensure they're able to get their, their abortion care. So those are the kind of policies that we need to be advancing in, in blue states and states that claim to be safe access states. And we need more and more of them to really step up and not just pass the laws, but put their money where their mouth is. Yep. Um, <laughs> there's so much. <laughs> there's so much. <laughs> That's why I'm like, I know. What, what's coming? I think I like technically forgot the question, but, um, with a this conversation. about criminalizing pregnancy criminalizing. outcomes, but oh, also yeah. we're wrapping up. All the there's things. something yeah. else you want to talk about. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I don't remember which uh, who said it, but there's no such thing as uh, too local, mm -hmm. right? Like what we um, see a lot of when um, folks are newly excited about something is they want to go and do a thing out there with a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. um, and I always tell folks, like, how how is it, like, with your family? Like, how is it with your neighbors? Like, if you are not responsible for educating those folks, like, is that then our responsibility? Like, get hyper local about mm -hmm. talking to people mm -hmm. um, about abortion. And I think also, like, when we're talking about decriminalizing, which it like, it, like hurts, right, in Texas, mm -hmm. and we've seen, you know, as y'all mm -hmm. know, like, uh, some pretty tragic things happen, and we're looking to get prepared for more of that to be to be happening. You know, they they're coming after us, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, don't talk shit about the South. Oh. I, <laughs> don't, don't talk away about the South. We're we're here and like, you know, we're holding it down. Mm -hmm. um, send resources yeah. our way and um, uplift our work. You know, um, I think 
as we move towards a broader um, strategy around decriminalization, we're going to be facing a lot of barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the work may not be the sexy stuff that mm -hmm. people are really excited about right now, but it is so necessary to keep our people out of jail. Mm -hmm. You know, as you all know, there was a recent case in Texas and you're talking about a half a million dollar mm -hmm. bail mm -hmm. and murder charges that destroys families, mm -hmm. that destroys communities, and we can't have that. And so we need folks to step up and um, continue to, to support our work. And I think the last thing that I'd like to say to folks who are interested in getting involved sort of newly is, is, is just that, um, you know, we've been putting it out there a lot. I think we're all kind of on the same page here, but like just, and I'll say this on the other panel too, like please don't use the coat hanger imagery. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's yeah. not the 70s anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we have the internet yeah. and we have access to resources and we have intrastate and national networks. Mm -hmm. um, we're more informed mm -hmm. and the internet is more of a utility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are resources and that just kind of adds mm -hmm. um, to the stigma. Um, and its shock value is literally zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it hurts our movement, so yeah. please don't do that. And um, also stop it with the handmade stuff yeah. as well. Yeah, um, it centers white women and white communities and um, doesn't tell our story and it doesn't represent our movement. Mm -hmm. um, so we need people yeah. to not do Thank that. You. Uh, Hangers um, also get in the way of true knowledge and education. Yeah, I yeah. read a story, yeah. and it was in Texas, SB8, and someone said they found out about abortion pills while Googling how to do a hanger abortion mm. <laughs> in 2021. Yeah. And I was like, can we just talk to people talk about, about self-managed yeah. self abortion? <laughs> yeah. Talk to people about yeah. self-managed abortion, talk yeah. to them about medication abortion. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. yeah. Fancy pills. Mm -hmm. Access. There oh, there. Yeah. I mean, um, could you give us some advice on organizing? <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. some advice on organizing. Um, I honestly, for folks that are tuning in and watching this, there's there, it's never too late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's That's never right. too late to join the movement because the like attacks on abortion justice and liberation predate us, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And when you li live in the intersections of being queer or Latina or person of color or immigrant, religious, et cetera, um, you live a life that will always ha be somebody's political playground. Mm. And you need, we as a collective and community power need to be able to come together, but to also understand that, th that we need to be each other's like safe space. We need to be each other's fiercest advocates. And we need the folks that are tuning in and the folks that are here with us in this moment to also not show up as allies, show up as accomplices. Because yeah. yeah. that's yeah. how you organize. Yeah. I want you shoulder yeah. to shoulder. Yeah. I want you to that's be right. in there in the mud with me mm -hmm. because when I'm tired, I need to be able to like trust. And that's something about organize. The advice on organizing that I'd give is find your trusted network mm -hmm. yeah. that you can turn to in the times when like, when Dobbs happened, who did you turn to? Mm -hmm. And many of those people for us are probably organizers mm -hmm. because the grief that we felt in that moment, yeah. we needed to turn into action. So if that's what you felt during Dobbs, if that's what you've been feeling for decades, mm -hmm. right? Trust that feeling that you know that freedom and liberation can be different and can be better because it, that's what we need mm -hmm. as organizers. That's the best advice I can give you. If you can answer what does freedom look like mm -hmm. or if you can't answer it, mm -hmm. Turn that into action mm -hmm. and find your people. Yes. People. Yeah. Finding your people. That also allows you the space you need to like rest and rejuvenate because mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like sometimes when you're an activist, you're just like, I'm just activating all I'm the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. you burn out and then it's like, oh, you can't get anything done. Yeah. Yeah. Would anyone like to have any final thoughts, um, share final thoughts with anyone, with the people who are watching our, our panel right now? You can say no. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, what y'all are doing by attending this today, that's huge. Like, yeah. I don't want that to go without being acknowledged. Y'all are sitting at, you know, we, Aria and I were talking about this. We saw house party pictures mm. of folks getting together and getting their friends together and, and watching this training today. And that is the exact kind of momentum we love to see building. We love to see people wanting to learn and wanting to learn before activating because there is so much misinformation out there right now. And I, I think to close for me, 
I feel very grateful to work at the National Institute of Reproductive Health for many reasons. Among them, we've worked with each of these mm. people and each of the organizations they represent, and we've been led into, pro into progress, into proaction by the folks here and the, the people, the communities they represent. And um, I guess, you know, my final, final is, is, take data privacy really seriously. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing I'm going to say. Download Signal if you don't have it already. Um, and don't comply in advance. Yeah. Uh, I would underscore something that my friend Renee Bracey Sherman, who I know was here today, um, shares, is that everyone loves someone who had an abortion. So this impacts every single one of us. And it's really critical to step up and to be engaged on the elected official side. Know your elected official. Speak to your elected official. Do not be scared. Their door is open. The people's house is real. <laughs> um, and whether they're friendly or not, they deserve to hear your voice. So make it, make your voice heard. Bring up crew. Again, storytelling is powerful. Make the ask and know that this is something that impacts every single one of us. It is intersectional. It interconnects with so many other movements. So step up and have your voices heard. Mm. Yeah, I also feel really grateful for, um, for this platform, for the work of AAF to like allow us to share this um, information with folks and for everyone who registered and signed up and is like, you know, clicking the link and, and watching. Um, we were talking about how there was something over 10,000 people who were registered to be here and that's amazing, amazing. and it's not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we should, yeah. it should have, you know, hit the million, 10 million person mark and so, you know, share this out with your folks and, um, you know, share the information that you learn here today with the people that you're organizing with um, and call folks in. If you see folks doing the, you know, coat hanger thing or re referring to their work as Underground Railroad or whatever it is, you know, call them in and let them know, hey, that's, you know, there's a, there's a big movement of people here who have, you know, been working really hard. That's like, led by people of color and mm -hmm. queer people and who have created transformative and inclusive language mm -hmm. um, about abortion and pregnancy and reproductive justice. And like, you know, it's, you know, our responsibility to follow their lead and just pull people into, um, pull people into the movement, be recruiters for our movement that way and take care of one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, take care of each other. Make sure that your friends drink water. <laughs> Make sure that, you know, that you have each other's backs. Thank you all panelists for sharing your leadership, your work, your dedication, your passion for abortion access. This is an area where each of us can lead and take charge in our communities. And I would like to invite Liz to come back. I'm and back, baby. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is such hard work, and I want to thank you all so much for it. And it's so true. Everybody loves somebody who's had an abortion. You've maybe had an abortion. Fight for outside yourself. Fight for those people you love. And truth be told, like, honestly, I love that y'all touched on the coat hanger thing. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to reiterate to folks, every time you're presenting in a way that, again, seems like you've seen someone in a handmade costume, that seems real. You see a coat hanger. Every time you're presenting in a way that either co-ops oppression of somebody else, but more importantly, you're not talking about the ways we can help. Every time you think of having a hanger, put it down, get language around promoting self-managed abortion. Mm -hmm. Like, That's it's right. just yeah. switch it out, right? And do that. And so you're going to go into your breakout panel to talk about how you can make legislative work happen. You're going to, in your exercises, you're going to call one of your state officials today. There's scripts in your toolkit. It's got scripts in there for you. Before you do it, get your squad together. Do some kind of pep talk so you can feel it. But stick to the script or don't. But call up with your heart and do not ask, do not suggest, demand and remind. Yeah what you need, because here's the truth all day, every day. You matter, fucking act like it. Yeah. Every day, all day, right? Your community matters, you matter. 
act like it, demand it. So thank y'all, you're incredible. Yeah. Okay guys, it's Liz again. How awesome was that panel? Amazing, right? So now it's activity time. Again, the activity guide, if you haven't downloaded it, it's your Bible for the day. Get it now. You can find it in the show notes or at operationsaveabortion.com. The tools in it include discussion prompts so you can give you some things to think about and talk about, some brainstorming questions, and a quick action to help you understand the session's topic a bit more. So have fun in these discussions. Be bold. You are organizers and change makers now, and we're so excited you're participating. So before I go and before you dive in, a couple of things. Make sure you plan for your next listening party before you leave today. It's crucial to stay engaged and hold each other accountable and also make sure you get vetted so you can really get to the big work. And don't forget, the vetting form is at operationsaveabortion.com and also in the show notes. Lastly, I just want to give thanks to all the panelists and participants in this series who gave their time to make this happen. I want to thank Ted Nelson of US TV and the incredible team he put together who donated their time, the dream team at Abortion Access Front who made this event happen, the volunteers who worked tirelessly and gave of all of their time, and to you for deciding to give of yourself at this crucial moment. You know, we at FBK Live and Abortion Access Front are here for you as we navigate these dark days, and we want to be a reliable info hub and a source of humor as we face some really hard times ahead. We are in this together. We got you and we all should have each other. You can continue to support Feminist Buzzkills Live and the special series we do like Operation Save Abortion in a few simple ways. Subscribe, write a review, give us five stars. It's the best way for our podcast to reach more people. And by doing so, you're helping more people learn about this assault on abortion access. To keep up with all the latest on reproductive rights news, follow Abortion Access Front on social at Abortion Front on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and at Abortion Access Front on YouTube. YouTube and TikTok. FBK Live is edited by Remy DeTarnay and is a production of Abortion Access Front and MSW Media. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy this series and get the most out of it. And I can't wait to see you out here making a difference in these reproductive streets.